Great. So it's a pleasure to uh, welcome um, uh, Dr. Tao Wang from UT Southwestern Medical Center and Jin Lim as today's speakers in this iReceptor Plus seminar. Um, uh, very nice to have you both here today. Um, uh, Dr. Wang will talk about deep learning based prediction of T cell receptor antigen binding specificity. And then uh, uh, Jin Lim will from Alchemap um, Therapeutics in the UK will talk about deciphering the language of antibodies using self supervised learning. So I think, uh, Tao, you can take it away. Very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks a lot for your invitation. I apologize for not turning on my camera today. I'm staying at home. I have two screaming kids. So, uh, so it's, uh, it's a little bit hard. So I'll turn off my camera. So my name is Tao Wang. I'm an assistant professor of the Quantitative Medical Research Center of Department of Population Data Sciences in UT Southwestern. Today, my talk is going to be focused on our recent work published in Nature Machine Intelligence for predicting the binding between T cell receptors and T cell antigens. So really, um, a few years back, when I first set out to uh, start my independent career, I was really amazed I, at, at the host immune system, how it interacts with like pathogens and, and tumor cells. There are a lot of different type of um, immune cell interacting with each other through complicated machine, uh, protein machinery. So, you, so and, and also this research here can be highly translational, um, uh, can really help patients. Uh, and there are a lot of data science opportunities there. So it, I was really uh, attracted to this field and started to work on it. And uh, over the past few years, my uh, lab has uh, worked on uh, work on T cells. We started to work on B cells, NK cells as well. We look at receptors and also antigens, B cell antigen, T cell antigens. And also most importantly, how the immune cell receptors interact with the new antigens. So that is the... Uh, uh, so uh, the interaction between the T cell receptor and the antigen uh, interactions is going to be the focus of today's talk. So I guess I can probably skip the introduction, but I, just in case you are not familiar with tumor new antigens. Um, so tumor new antigens are short peptides that help the immune cells identify and fight cancer cells. So we have T cells. T cells have the T cell receptor that they use to recognize the tumor cells and kill, the, uh, initiate the killing of the tumor cells. And, and the tumor cells, they have mutations in the DNA or maybe like mutation, like some other sources of new antigen exist, of course. And so for example, for the mutations in the DNA, they will be translated to protein with, so it's going to be mutated proteins. And the mutated proteins will be chopped into short peptides and be presented on the surface of the tumor cells by the MHC molecules. And so that's what, what actually what the T cell receptors recognize. And we have, actually we have three parts here. So forming this complex, the T cell receptors, the new antigen and, and the MHC. And this is actually called, uh, these two parts actually is sometimes called the PMHC. And over the past few years, people have really shown that new antigens are, could be really important for prediction predicting the prognosis of the patients, predicting the responsiveness of the patients to checkpoint inhibitors. There are also new antigen vaccines. So I think everyone would agree that new antigens are very important, uh, a very important thing to, uh, uh, to do research on. Of course, we do see a lot of conflicting evidence actually. So some papers say new antigen can predict, I mean, new antigen can't can predict responsiveness. Some other papers say the opposite thing. So we do see a lot of conflicting evidence in this field. So I think one of the problems is that underlying this conflicting literature is that not new antigens are truly immunogenic. By immunogenic, we mean that they can truly induce uh, T cell responses. So in various papers, the reported immunogenicity rate of new antigens ranges from one, one 1% to 60%, depending on like the experimental system. And uh, because new antigens are highly personal, I mean, personal to the patient, and the TCR also has a lot of var uh, 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 variability. So the binding between the TCRs and the new antigens is also, is also highly uh, specific. So it's, a, it's usually a specific TCR binding to a specific new antigen. Also, we do see some ambiguity there, but it's still highly, highly specific. So even less is known about the TCR binding specific, specificity of, new, of PMHCs. And of course, there are experimental approaches to, to answer this question, such as ELISPOR and tetramer analysis, and some, some more recent 
uh, high throughput type of uh, sequencing technologies. But still, uh, this they are identifying the TC, binding affinity of TCRs towards T cell antigens or new antigens is uh, is costly and labor intensive and cost uh, and, and also it takes a lot of time. So it's not not ideal. So really predicting the TCR binding affinity of new antigens uh, uh, MSC complex, given the TCR sequence, new antigen sequence, and MHC type is really one of the most, I, I think one of the most important questions in the field of computational immunology uh, nowadays. So we uh, took a three-stage approach to lower, lower the difficulty level of, the predict of this prediction problem. As you can imagine, there are a lot of flexibility in the TCR, right? It does not really have a very rigid protein structure. This actually the same can be said for the peptide. It's not, does not really have that much of a fixed structure. So there's a huge search space. How then how, how can we really predict it? it? It's not trivial at all. So what we did is that we took a three-stage approach. And in the first stage, we learned an embedding, a numerical embedding of the TCR. So the TCR amino acid symbols can now be represented by a, a number, a, a few, a few numbers. We did the same thing for the PMHCs to get a new numeral embedding. So that, that is how we lower the difficulty level of this prediction problem. And in the final stage, we can now finally uh, achieve to, uh, the learning of the pairing between TCRs and PMHCs using, using a, a, an approach called transfer learning. All right. So, oh. Oh, I should leave this. So in the first stage, we learned a numerical embedding of the TCRs. Actually, in this particular work, we focus on CDR3 on, uh, of the beta chain. Um, but, uh, but I think probably alpha chains may be also, should probably be also quite important. But in this particular work, we only look at the beta chain. So we did, uh, we used what we call a deep learning autoencoder to encode the TCR amino acid sequence into first into a big numerical matrix by actually factors. And this autoencoder will seek to reproduce this matrix, this numerical matrix here in the output through what we call a bottleneck layer. It's, it's like, I remember it's like 15 or 20 uh, uh, neurons or 20 numbers we put in the bottleneck that can re represent this very complicated analysis sequence of the TCR, uh, CDR3B. So we are, we are quite successful actually. So you, for example, let's look at these two CDR3s and you can see that the initial actual factor numerical matrix looks like this. So numbers, so the color density here represents the numbers. And you can see the reconstructed, the reconstructed CDR3 from the bottleneck is actually very close to the original CDR3. The same for this one. So it's, so it's quite good. So actually, this this autoencoder forms uh, uh, the basis of another Nature Methods publication we published earlier that year. I will, I will briefly talk about it uh, later. Okay, so much for the TCR. We also learned a numerical embedding of the PMHCs. So um, so what we did here is not not really very very fancy here. So I guess you probably know the Net MSC Pen software pub published by Nissan at all since 2007, they improve it over the years. And here their software predicted the binding of the peptide towards the HLA alleles. So we took advantage of that. Uh, the, the, we took advantage of that because they also use a deep learning of not a new, neural network approach. So we hypothesized that the top few layers of their new, neural net network can capture the biological meaning of the peptide and also the MHC. Although their final output is the binding between peptide and MHC, but we think the few layers close to the top should contain important information about their overall status as well. So what they took, uh, their approach is that they look at 34 SNPs in the HLA essentially, and also look at, look at the, uh, the T cell antigens from A to 11 uh, amino acid, uh, uh, amino acid and embedded them by the Broson 62 matrix. And uh, okay, oh, I should have shown the net. Anyway, so we sort of reproduce their work, but using more updated of uh, deep learning techniques such as LSTM and, and other things. And uh, but essentially, it's very similar to their work. So 
but we, we created our own version. So we have access to their internal layers. And you can see that uh, the correlation between the predicted binding of the peptide towards MHC versus the gold, gold standard is actually quite good. It increased with the training, training cycles. And if you compare to the publication, for example, the third version of NetMHC pen, uh, actually our performance is actually slightly better than their performance, I, I think overall. So, so it's, it's quite good. Now we have the numeric embedding of the PCR, we have the numeric embedding of the PMCs. We can now finally move on to learn the pairing between uh, these, these two, two parts. So we accumulated really a lot of data from uh, different sources. I will not go into details because it's really too, too much. So we have a uh, training data set, we have testing data set. The training data set are like bumps from big databases like IEDB or from those high school food, uh, sequencing technology that can uh, uh, give us the binding between TCRs and PMCs. We imagine those data may be a, of a little bit lower quality, maybe. Uh, then for the train testing data set, we manually created about 32,000 binding pairs from various sources. So for this data, data set, we are a little bit strict with our criteria. So we, so comparatively, we look, only look at those uh, binding pairs that have gone through multiple rounds of uh, validation or, or, or and, 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 and anyway, so we think the testing data set may be a, of a little bit higher quality. It also, it's much smaller uh, uh, too. No, okay, so now we have the, the model, now we have the data. So how do we exactly do the training, right? So we were motivated by this paper published actually in 2018. Um, here, they are, their task is to uh, find in a gallery of uh, pictures, the picture among that from the gallery that best match the query picture. So they developed this so-called so tripped learning, trip, tripped learning approach, uh, where they have one uh, one query image, they have one positive image during the training, and one negative image, and and the model tries to learn the difference between the positive image and the negative image, so so they can pull the target, the positive image, and the query image closer will push the negative image and the query image away from each other. So we did sort of, we were motivated by that approach. So we did a sort of a similar thing here. So we have those, those positive pair, right? So we, I just mentioned, we created from databases, publications, and other sources. We use random mismatching to create 10 times negative pairs. And uh, importantly here, we always bundle the P and MHC uh, uh, together. So we're really learning the binding between TCRs and PMHCs, not, not learning the binding between peptide and PMHC. Okay, so that's one little thing there. So anyway, here we also ask our model to learn the difference between the positive pairs and the negative pairs. So hopefully we can, uh, the model uh, in, in, in this way, the model can, can learn the true binding affinity of TCRs towards uh, new antigens. And we also have a sort of a little bit tweak in the loss function. So to implement this idea of the trip, trip to learning, and also we added some penalty terms there to, to help the model uh, converge. And you can see that, yeah, yeah, in the training data set and the independent validation data set, the, the loss function uh, move in a, in a good direction is uh, sort of stable. The, it, do not see too much overfitting there, so which is good. So now we move on to, uh, to do the validation. So in the train testing cohort, we have a, to start with, we have a cohort of 600 truly binding TCRs and PMC pairs uh, actually created from 30 studies. It's a lot of work there. And we uh, use our model to predict the binding. And actually, because we did this trick, we did this like random mismatching uh, in the training set, we sort of did a similar thing in the testing data set. So in the testing data set, we compare each TCR uh, against a pool of 10,000 10,000 background TCR and give a percentile rank. But the smaller this rank is, the higher the binding is. So if you look at the 600 uh, binding pairs for the positive pairs, our binding percentile rank, predicted binding percentile rank is, is actually really, really small. And for the negative pairs, it's very close to 0.5, which suggests the, the negative TCRs are really negative TCR. So it's a, it's a random distribution there. 
And if we use the AUC of RC, you can see that our AUC achieved 0 0.83 something, which is which is quite quite good. It's not not one yet, of course, but it's, it's still already quite good. And also during the review of our paper, our uh, our reviewers don't believe our results. They said uh, you you just over, over overfitted your model on this data set. So they pointed out some other data set for us to validate. And we, we took a close look at those, I think, two data sets. We also actually also achieved AUC around 0 0.8. So I think it's not really overfitting. We can really achieve this level of AUC um, uh, yeah, confidently. Okay, so you may, you may be wondering, maybe, maybe the model is only doing prediction, can only do prediction right for the HR area for, or, or, H, or TCRs on the antigens that are existing, that are pre-existing in the training data set. So it may not uh, translate very well to new HR alios, new TCRs, or new PMHCs. So we uh, split that 600 data, a uh, 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 pair, binding pair cohort into like uh, into a subset where the TCRs do not exist in the training data set before. And we look at each, each, each TCR or maybe each HL, HLALO not existing in the, in the training cohort or maybe uh, each epitope. And overall, we do see very stable performance for those new TCRs, new HLALOs, new, new peptides. So we are confident that the model is really learning some generalizable knowledge about the binding pair rather than just remembering what it, it has seen before. Okay, so that we also did a lot of other uh, validations. For example, we try to ask the model to see if it can distinguish like small differences in the peptides or small differences in the TCRs. For example, in this study, they, they look at a, a series of peptide analog. They, I think they did like one amino acid uh, substitutions in the peptide and they measured the binding affinity of the peptide to, to, given, to the given TCR, to the same TCRs. And some of the, some, some of the peptide will have stronger binding, some of the TCR, sorry, the peptide will have uh, slightly worse binding, binding strengths. And then we did the prediction, and let's look at the percentile rank. Again, for, their, for the truly stronger binding uh, peptide analogs, our predicted percentile rank are again smaller. Uh, meaning we have a stronger predicted binding compared to the weaker uh, peptides. And the AUC here uh, reached 0 0.7 something. So I think it's quite good because we are trying to distinguish very similar peptides. So it's sort of expected the AUC will be lower, but 0 0.7 is, is, is already quite good. Okay, so for the TCR, we did some other thing as well. We look at the protein structure. For example, for this TCR, uh, a PMC complex from PDB, we look at, uh, we mutated each amino acid of the CDR3 and try to see whether that will induce a, how much of change in the predicted binding strength will be caused by that mutation. We did two things. So we just, in one of the mutation analysis, we set all the numbers of the CDR3 embedding to zero. We call that zero setting. And we also did a sort of uh, mimic the analyst scanning. Uh, uh, experiments uh, commonly used in biophysics experiments, we change the numerical embedding of each amino acid to uh, anonym. And then we do the prediction again and to see how much of a change there is. And for example, for example, for this particular structure, you can see that uh, it seems that this, this guy has the strongest overall, this guy has the strongest uh, change in predictive, predictive binding strength uh, after the mutation analysis. So we did that for all the all the structures we can find, and, and look at the, the mutate the CDR3s and uh, see, see how much of a change there is. We chopped the CDR3 into six segments um, of equal length and measured the the, the normalized uh, binding rank differences in the wild type and the mutated CDR3s, and you can see that the middle parts of the CDR3 when they are mutated they will lead to the biggest change, actually usually the biggest loss of the binding affinity towards the PMHC, which totally makes sense, right? Because the middle parts of the CDR3 bulge out and become, and they have closer, closer contact with the PMHC. So it makes sense that we see, we see uh, the bigger changes here in, in general. 
And also we try to be more specific here. We examined all the protein structures and find the CDR3 amino acids that are within four Armstrong of any PMHC amino acid. We call them the contacted uh, CDR3 amino acids. And the other ones are called uncontacted. And again, when we mutate the contacted uh, amino acids, the predicted binding strength will have a larger loss, a larger change compared to the uncontacted ones. Okay, so 10x uh, genomics, they, they, a few, about three years back, they released four data sets where they did this barcoding, uh, additional barcoding uh, for the T cells against a, an array of 44 PMCs. So it's essentially a 10x single cell sequencing data sets with single cell TCR sequencing data sets, and also with the binding affinity of the T cells towards 44 PMC, uh, PMC uh, com complexes. So we leverage this data set as well. We uh, first we did this experiment, this validation experiment to see whether there's any uh, correlation between the clonal size of the T cells versus the predicted binding rank for any of those 44. 44 PMCs. And we actually, we see that consistently, consistently across all four data sets that when we have smaller binding rank, uh, I mean, overall for those 44 PMCs for, for a T cell clonal type, that T cell clonal type will have a higher uh, clone size, which makes sense, right? So when there's a stronger binding, there's more likely a, a bigger uh, clonal size, a, cl a clonal expansion of that T cell clonal type. And we also get some, some data from our collaborator from, uh, from MD Anderson. They didn't do this particular tennis genomics and, uh, experiments, but they did something similar. Uh, they did, uh, or not some, they did the bulk TCR sequencing for T cells uh, of against four of viral epitope. And we, we again see the same thing that for the T cell chronotype with stronger binding, I mean, smaller binding rank, predicted binding rank against those four uh, epitopes, they're Chronotype, these these are chronotype uh, size, chronotype size are also larger, and, and we show that this is not an artifact. We did some some random mismatching to uh, to create a, a, a background ratio, and the, the ratio here is indeed higher than the background ratio. Also, we we did some uh, expression analysis, and we show that indeed for the T cells predicted to bind the epitopes. And the T cells the, the, that are not predicted to bind the epitope, the gene expression differences are enriched in some uh, geo terms that are related to, uh, to, to T cell functions. Okay, so now we have built the model, we have validated the model, we now try to apply our model to, to other more, more, more cohorts. Is it, uh, here uh, the TCGA cohort to show that whether we can review any tr new knowledge uh, use, using our tool. For example, in the TCGA datasets, we predicted all the new antigens. We also predicted uh, self antigens, or some people say it TAA, tumor associated antigens. And for, for kidney cancer, uh, there's a, a known HERF E that is a, re, a retrovirus reactivated in kidney cancer, which is pretty famous. There's a clinical trial on that, and people have identified four immunogenic peptides in that particular HERV. So we also, for kidney cancer, we also included that particular uh, HERV in our analysis. And we did this uh, assay. So we look at all the predicted new antigens, self antigens and HERV E peptides. And we try to predict whether any, whether each peptide will bind to any of the TCRs found in the same TCJ patient. And for example, for these new antigens in this patient, we have one, 169 uh, new antigens, 12 of them have a TCR, uh, uh, have, have a TCR that is, that is predicted to bind to it. So we did, of course, you all say that there's a bind cutoff you need to draw, right? So we started with 2% uh, binding percentile rank uh, as, the, as the cutoff. And we also did, we choose uh, several other cutoff uh, to define the binding between TCRs and PMCs. And we calculated on the y-axis, we calculated this ratio of the, each class of uh, peptides uh, having uh, the, the probability of each class of peptides having a, uh, uh, having a predicted binding TCR partner, essentially like that. 
So you can see that the chances for new antigens to have a true TCR binding within the same patient is higher than self antigen, which makes a lot of sense, right? Because new antigens, they are new to the patients, totally new to the patients. Well, self antigen or tumor associated antigens, they are not so new to the patients. So it's expected that we, we do not see too much of, or we see a lower probability of the, the TCRs in the patient recognizing self antigens uh, compared to new antigens. But, but very inter interestingly, for kidney cancer, we see that the chances for those four HERV-E, well-validated HERV-E peptides to be recognized by T cells is higher than new antigen, and then again, higher than self antigens, which makes a lot of sense because those, those four peptides have really been uh, very well validated through, through uh, experiments. So we are, we are really confident in the quality of those HERV-E peptides, and it turned out they have the higher ch highest chances of being recognized by the TCRs, uh, again, validating our results. We look, also look at, look at the other side of the story as well. We look at the T, T cells and we look at which T cells have predicted binding uh, towards any of those new antigens or self antigens or HERV-V uh, versus the other TCR not predicted to bind at all. So we calculated the clonal, clonal size again for those TCR binding TCRs and non-binding non TCRs. And we try to see whether, uh, and here again, we, we choose smaller and smaller cutoff, or in other words, more and more stringent cutoff to define the binding. And we, we can see that the ratio between the clonal size of the binding TCR divided by the clonal sizes of the non-binding TCR become larger and larger when we drew, drew more and more stringent cutoff. Again, validating that, uh, the, for the binding TCRs, uh, their uh, clonal sizes are really larger as predicted uh, by our model. Okay, so, so this is a summary of our model, uh, sorry, sorry, of, of, of the PMT network uh, we just published in, in Nature Machine Intelligence. Uh, the, we build this uh, model, which we call PMT net, and uh, this is the GitHub, uh, feel free to try it. And we validated our model in several, in actually many other external validation data sets, which are sort of confident that the AUC should be around 0 0.8 something. And we also applied it to, to, uh, uh, to TCG data set to try to see if we can review some new biological insights. And we do see that antigen of different classes have different levels of, uh, or different probability of inducing uh, T cell responses. And also, uh, we, we showed that in our paper that we can use this PMTNet tool as a building block of a, uh, uh, sorry, of a biomarker for predicting patients' uh, uh, prognosis and response to checkpoint inhibitors. So I, I, I didn't go into the, I didn't show any slides for that, but you can check our paper for our results. So in addition to our, to our work, uh, in the in predicting the binding between T cell receptors and TC, uh, T cell antigens, we also have a back to back work actually uh, that try to integrate TCRs with the gene expression at the single cell at the single cell level. So we created that TCR in, uh, TCR in encoder algorithm, which become part of the PMT net software, but also become part of this work. And in this work, we try to integrate the TCRs with the gene expression at the T single T cell level. So uh, we actually we observed something quite interesting is that we collected uh, about twenty data, single T cell data single cell RNA sequencing T cell uh, a data sets of T cells with matched single cell TCR sequencing, and we calculated this distance between the different TCR clonal types using the TCR embedding algorithm we just which we just mentioned, and also we calculated the, the differences between these TCR clonal types in terms of their gene expression. And we sort of observe a positive correlation uh, consistently across all the data sets that, that we collected, suggesting that when T, T cells have similar TCRs, they are going to have similar gene expression programs. So, and this serves as the basis for us to build a model, which we call TESA, to integrate TCR, TCRs and gene expression. So we have the numerical embedding of the CDR3s, we have the gene expression, and we build a hierarch base hierarchical model to integrate these, these two parts of information. 
So in the core of the model, we try to maximize the correlation between the TCRs and the, the gene expression. At the same time, we also build clusters of, of what we call networks of, of TCRs. So essentially each network of TCR are composed, comprised of a set of TCRs that are high, highly similar to each other, hopefully targeting the same antigen. And we, we, for this maximization on the left side, it is done only within each TCR network. So we need to show that the TCR network we constructed are really truly reflective of the epitope binding specificity, right? So again, we come back to those four single cell data sets from 10x genomics, and we show, show the purity of the TCR network in terms of antigen targeting specificity. And we show that our antigen targeting specificity purity is really high. Like for example, in donor four, for all the TCR coronal type networks we constructed, there uh, all the TCRs within each network target the same antigen according to those the barcode counts of those uh, 44 PM, uh, PMC complexes. And we also, we also did GLEAF and the perf performance is not as high. Okay, so we also, we, we, now we have those TCR networks. Uh, we try to see if we can derive any meaning from those networks, right? So for each network or each cluster of, of, of TCRs, we calculated what we, we uh, designated, designated what we call an average TCR or center TCR of each TCR network. So we have the numerical embedding of the TCRs. We, take, we calculated the, the average of those at the TCR net, uh, those TCR embedding, and we found the TCR network, we, sorry, the TCR clonal type within this TCR network that is closest to the average TCR. And we denote that's the center of the TCR network. And then all the other TCR uh, clonal type within that network are called non-centered. And we calculated the difference, uh, sorry, the distance between all the, all the TCRs within that TCR network to, uh, to the, the distance to the center TCRs. And we overlaid all those TCRs here according to their distance. And we cal calculated the, the barcoding counts, uh, which reflects the binding affinity of each TCR clonal type uh, uh, towards those uh, PMCs, 44 PMCs. The, the higher that number, the higher the y-axis, the stronger binding there is. And you can see that we, we chop those TCRs into six segments according to their distances to the center TCR. And you can see that indeed the center TCR have the strongest binding uh, towards those PMCs. Uh, and, and the more dissimilar those TCRs are from the center TCR, the less the strong, uh, the less the binding strength. So, so we really see a, our, our TCR network really revealed a gradient of antigen targeting efficiency uh, within, the, within the TCR networks. Okay, so we also, we also, uh, showed that we also, again, calculate the coronal sizes of the TCR networks uh, for, for the center TCR coronal types and the non-center TCR coronal types. We hypothesize that we should see uh, higher uh, coronal sizes for the center TCR versus the non-center TCR. We look at both the CD8 uh, T, T cells and also CD4 T cells. And uh, we here, we do see that uh, almost Across all the all the data sets, there is a stronger uh, sorry there is a stronger clonal expansion of the center TCR compared to the non center TCR, and uh, yeah yeah the results here support that. Okay, so I, I think the biological interpretation here is that uh, in the in the human the in, uh, the host immune system will ca carry out multiple rounds of uh, TCR. Uh, TCR VDJ recombination to target the same antigen. So essentially it come up, comes up with different solutions against the same antigen. And, and we sort of take a majority vote and we, we guess that the average of those solutions represents the best guess. So that is our center TCR hypothesis. And here we do see that the center TCR, they do have a higher expansion, clone expansion, they do have higher binding strengths measured by that bar, barcoding technology. So, uh, which confirms our hypothesis that uh, of this convert what we call a convergent TCR recombination of uh, 
towards the same uh, same uh, antigen. So that's that's the biological discovery of our story in the Nature Matters paper. So I would like to acknowledge the students in my lab, uh, uh, Zhang and uh, Tian Shi Lu. Uh, uh, Zhe did the uh, the Tesla work. Tian Shi did the PMT network, and and other people contributed as well. And I would also like to acknowledge my uh, collaborators in MD Anderson in NIH. Um, uh, NYU Langang Health and also in SMU for helping with my projects. And also I would like to uh, uh, acknowledge the funding agencies who funded, uh, who supported my research. So that's my last slide. I welcome any questions. Very beautiful talk. Um, any questions from the audience? So before, um, the questions are coming in. I will maybe ask a question. Um, so for your first story for the um, TCR epitope um, prediction, um, uh, how did you handle or did you handle or what do you think about the problem of data leakage that you know you have similar TCRs or antigens epitopes in the training and test data? Yeah, so, so that's, that's, what, a, that's a concern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, uh, that's what we did here. So we for those, for example, for those 600 uh, cohorts that our first validation cohort, we split it into the T, uh, in, into uh, one sub uh, a subset of the cohort uh, whose TCRs have never been seen in the training cohort. Of course, I, I, I can sure, sure. The but, yeah. but what about similar TCRs? Yeah, so we, we yeah. right, that's good question. So actually, I don't, I do not have the figures here, but we, in our paper, are, we do have a, a figure showing that uh, we measured the similarity of the TCRs mm -hmm. to any of our training TCR, mm -hmm. and we increase the, in, in, uh, uh, increase the cutoff to define the dissimilar TCR to define the subset of those six hundred uh, uh, binding pairs. Right, we can see that in general the prediction accuracy do not decrease too much. Hmm. And then it could also be right that similar TCS could have different binding, uh, not not a similar binding, right? So that's... Um, that yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, yeah, so that's also a possibility. But yeah. I think in general, I mean, on average population level, we should see that similar TCR find similar antigens. Hmm. So that, that's also the rationale for us to try like different cutoff to define the dissimilar TCR. And with the most dissimilar TCRs, we still see decent uh, prediction, and not as good as 0 0.8, but still decent prediction accuracy. Hmm. 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 Very nice, very nice. Any questions? I have a, one question regarding the negative examples that you have in your training in the first uh, story. Yeah. Uh, when you have the triplet approach, mm -hmm. uh, so the negative pairs, how mm -hmm. did you choose the proportions and where uh, the question is whether the proportions between the positive pairs and the negative pairs affected your performance? Yeah, so that's, that's a good question. We didn't test uh, like very comprehensively about that. So our rationale is like, uh, we, we choose like uh, 10 times negative pair uh, first. So we didn't, uh, our rationale for choosing the 10, 10 times is that first we uh, uh, we want to create more ne negative pairs. That, that's definitely for sure, right? Uh, because there are, for, for any TCR and any PMC in the, in the real world, there's more chance that they do not bind than they bind. So we want to choose more negative pairs, but we do not want to choose too many neg negative pairs because it is well known in the machine learning world that if you have unbalanced data, your prediction, the learning of your predictive model is going to suffer. So here, one, one versus 10 will give us like 9% of the data being positive, 91% being negative. So that's already quite unbalanced. So we do not want to make it too unbalanced for the big learning model. So it will not learn anything. So that's our rationale, but we didn't test whether like five times or 20 times is going to be better. We just tested 10 times. Okay. And, and another uh, related question, uh, did you discover or detected certain TCRs that are actually not learnable? Probably there are TCRs that are easier to learn and that they, they, they bind to the 
peptides and other TCRs that are much more difficult to predict. Did you yeah, try to figure this out? Yeah, that's, that's another good question. We didn't uh, do anything about it in our, uh, in our paper, but I'm, I'm, I'm certain in our validation cohort, we probably will, will see some TCRs that are predicted very well. Some TCRs can never be predicted very, very well. We, we, I'm sure we have those, those cases in our data and maybe it will be a good follow-up project to look at what happened to those unlearnable TCRs so whether we can do anything about them or maybe it's just some biological uh, there's there's some something truly bio biological about this not unlearnable TCRs, but it's, it's a complicated question, but, but a good question. Thank you. And there's a question in the chat, Tao. Yeah. Can you see the question? Yeah, um, um, yeah CD4 TCRs and murine data sets. Uh, that's a very good question. So um, um, the answer is, is uh, not so far. So CD4 TCRs, uh, the binding there is. Uh, so it's a little bit more complicated because you, you know for the CD4 T cells there are T helper cells and T rag cells, and from what I understand there are T helper epitopes and T rag epitopes as well. So it's really complicated, and the data there are not as much as for CD8 T cells. So we didn't do anything about CD4 T cells so far, but but I think that's definitely a very important question. And for murine data sets, unfortunately, our model cannot do that. We only work on humans so far. But I do get a lot of requests from my collaborators to work on uh, mouse data sets. So maybe we'll do, in, do it in, in the near future. Any more questions from the audience? Hello, I have a very quick follow-up question um, about kind of related to the previous question on data balancing. So. Uh, have you thought about the effects also, not necessarily of the balancing between the positive and negative pairs, but for example, within the positive pairs, which PMHCs come up more often than other PMHCs, for example, if that makes sense? You mean filter out the training data sets based on the frequency of the HLA alleles? Uh, no, well, no, not necessarily the HLA alleles, but for example, imagine a situation where the training data has, you know, a one to 10 ratio of positive and negative, but within the positive pairs, you know, 90% of the positive pairs are matches between some CDR3 sequence and a PMHC of a um, particular epitope from CMB. And then the rest 10% are like other things. Obviously, you know, oh, there could be, you know, so how, how did you balance that? Or was there any consideration for that? Yeah, that's, okay. I think you asked a, a good question. So, so, you know, so in our training, we use this, uh, yeah, the, the, this negative uh, pairing approach I, I'm showing on this slide. On the testing, on, uh, or on the in the prediction, well, in the prediction uh, actually. So what we did is that for each target PMC and each target TCR, we'll look at we'll look at a background of one uh, sort of ten thousand, I think ten thousand background TCRs against the same PM, PMC. So so the effect on the bias, I mean the bias the effect of the bias in terms of selection of peptide and MHC allele is sort of canceled out because we always uh, query against the same PMC for the target TCR and for the background one, 10,000 TCRs. So that effect is sort of canceled out and we do not, do not need to worry about that. But in the validation of the 600 cohort, yeah, I think you made, made a good point. We, yeah, if, if, if the next time we do this validation, we'll probably take that into consideration. So far, we are just doing a naive approach of random mismatching. So yeah, maybe the random mismatching already sort, sort of take care of that problem. But I'm, I, I'm not so sure, but you raise a good point that we can, that can help us improve our, our validation. Thank you. I see, thank you. More questions from the audience? And I have a question also regarding this slide again about the negative um, data set. So um, do you have any intuition, um, maybe in your unpublished work also, what the impact of how you choose the negative set um, impacts your classifier? Did you- The way we construct the negative pairs? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, again, a good question, which we do not have a good answer to. So right now we we are really naive in just doing really naive random mismatching between the TCRs mm -hmm. and the PMCs. Mm -hmm. So some people criticize that maybe in your random mismatch uh, negative set you do have some positive pairs there, right? 
just by chance, maybe the TCR is dirty, it can bind to many new entities. Uh, that, that definitely happens. We, we are aware of that, but I think the chance that it happens is really small to an extent that's uh, sort of uh, negligible. And also when we have this sort of problem, it will lower our AUC, not inflate the AUC, AUC so it is an artifact. So we are, so in terms of, uh, uh, like calculating the AUC of RC uh, for, for for this cohort, we are not particularly worried about it. Um, yeah, but this is good good idea to test out different ways of constructing this negative set. Because it, I mean, it's not just how you pair and the cross reactivity. It could also be different underlying distribution of TCRs, sequence similarity, different uh, peptide MHC um, distributions. You know how this would impact. Um, the prediction accuracy on the classifier on an unseen data set where the distributions are again different, maybe. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that could be an issue, I, I admit, but I do not have an answer to yeah. that. That's yeah, I, I, I get your point, I get your point, but I, I don't have an, an yeah. intuition about that yet. Yeah, and then uh, towards the second story, the Nature Method paper, which is also very interesting. Um, so, um, in as if I understood correctly, um, here you integrate um, TCR and also transcriptome, right? Yeah. So could you talk a bit about how this work differs from the Nature Biotech paper um, from the Phil Bradley and Paul Thomas lab, this Conga paper, where they also integrate um, TCR and transcriptome? Can you comment on that? Uh, I, I, actually, I need to apologize. I'm not aware of that paper. Okay. So. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Then we um. Then, but there is one more question in the chat now, so we can take that, and then I have one more question afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so do not have to do try to do this. Yes, we try, we do the same for PMC. We do the same for P. We do the same for MSC. We do the same for TCRs, and uh, meaning that yeah, yeah. So so in, in general, we we see a little bit of loss in prediction accuracy, but it's, it, there, it's still quite comparable to, uh, to, to the other subset. So, so we are not too worried about it, about overfitting. Yeah. Great. So, and for the second story, you found these center uh, TCRs that have higher affinity, you said, right? Is that yes. correct? Yes. Um, did, you, um, did you check whether there's any correlation with them with um, uh, generation probability or their selection probability? Is there any um, relation to that? Did you look into that? Yeah, that's, that's, a, good, that's a good point. We didn't, we, we, didn't, we didn't look into that, but that, that's a good point. We, we, something we should have done uh, uh, when we were working on, on, on that. Paper. A good suggestion. <laughs> okay. good, good, good. There, and there is... Um, one more question, are your training and data sets publicly available? Probably, yes, I guess. Uh, for the PMT, yes, uh, they are on our GitHub. Great. Great. Any more questions from the audience? Could, could you please uh, put the links for the publications and uh, data in, in the chat, please? Uh, hold, hold on one sec. Let me, let me stop sharing and put up. You can do this after your, after we're done. Maybe you can, maybe you can email me. I'll, I'll send send the information to you. Um, any more questions? If not, we will take a break, nine minute break, and then we come back at uh, five p.m. my time with Jin Lee. Okay, short break of nine minutes. Thanks, everyone, and thanks Tao again for the beautiful talk. Very nice. Thank you. And uh, thanks for all the questions, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>